What's your name? I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? Do you guys see me up there? Oh, I was pretty good. That was also one of my dreams. Um, <laughs> okay, so this morning, first of all, I want to say good morning. 
to all of you in here, to all of you in Daniel, and to all of you in Merit. Today we have people in Merit. So everyone wave to Merit. Okay. Uh, but as you guys saw in that video, Worship Weekend is going to be this weekend. If you want to participate in that, there will be sign-ups in the lobby of Henderson um, right after chapel. You do, however, if you can't make it to those sign-ups, you do need to sign up by 4.30 today, and you can do that in the Sullivan Building. Um, the second thing is there's a meeting for upcoming mission trips. Um, that's going to be tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. in Chapman Multimedia Room. And then tonight, there's going to be a concert. At 7 p.m. here by Hank Murphy. He's turned around. By Hank Murphy. And um, it's going to be free. So you guys should definitely come out to it. Who was here in chapel last week by a show of hands? Okay, so you guys know, or two weeks ago, I guess. You know you made my dream come true, right? By doing the whole crowd chant. Today I'm going to fulfill another dream. I always wanted to open up for a rap artist. So here goes nothing. Yes. Well, for you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. You have no idea. Chapel is fulfilling my dreams and bringing me closer to Jesus. Okay. So keep in mind while you're here, why we're here, um, it's to get plugged into the kingdom of God to learn more about who he is. So I'm going to put myself in a way. And I ask that all of you guys do that as well. Cell phone, iPad, um, Palm Pilot, if those are even a thing anymore. Um, just put them away. Uh, really focus on what Clayton King is speaking about and um, just draw closer to Jesus in this time. Thanks. Anderson University, what's up? We come to worship the Lord this morning. Come on, let's stand. It's so good to be with you here. We come to sing our praise to Christ our Savior, Christ who satisfies, Christ our reward and our boast. Our souls are restless until we rest in Him. So come on, can we just tell Him this morning? Jesus, you are the strength of my heart, my portion forever. And no matter what, Lord, you're enough. Come on, sing with me. Christ is my reward, all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world. Satisfied, you want to see his glory today, Anderson. Through every child, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free. today and this hope will never fail heaven is our home oh, through every storm my soul will sing Jesus is here to God be
this is you. You've made this your resolve. Sing it. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. We surrender, Lord. Decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before. better for our souls this morning than to tell him how much we need him. Come on. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you oh I need tell him every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need Good news, your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in me Oh 
I'm scheming all the wrong schemes. There's only one God and there's only one king. I can live for one truth to run around the sea. I hear them talking about that yellow and they thinking that they freak. But it ain't working because that pleasure too cheap. Spending love on all the wrong things, but that temporary thrill don't come with the receipt. Let's break it down. I need you now. Simplify my life before I run it in the ground. And anything in the way of your ways you can take in Mayweather, go ahead and knock it down. It ain't easy, but it finally makes sense. The simple life is worth it, I'm convinced. It ain't about me, so I don't need the letter I spell it S M P L F Y and give me that simple life. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Yes, I need you. Every hour, I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Come on in, listen. Tell it. Lord, I need you. statement of our lives. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in Anderson as it is in heaven. Lord, what's true this morning? is exactly what we've just sung, that we are just a crowd of people, a mass of people. Every one of us, we're all just a bunch of people who need Jesus. No one escapes that need. No one escapes the truth that only Christ can save and satisfy our souls. Lord, I know that right now, what's gonna happen in this moment, right now, is the greatest privilege in all the, all the universe. Your word is going to be opened. Your gospel is going to be preached. And God, we know what 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, verse 18. It says the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So God, I pray, as the gospel, as your glorious, beautiful gospel, the good news that is the gospel of Jesus, that as it is preached, as it reaches our ears and our hearts, I pray for my brothers and my sisters in front of me that it would not be received as foolishness, but that it would be received as it is, as it actually is, the power of God for salvation. God, for those in this room who have always rejected the gospel, for those who have always received it as foolishness, God, would you do the work that only you can do, that only the Holy Spirit can do, and turn foolishness into truth. Would you take hearts who have received the gospel as foolishness, and today may it be received as the power of God. We give you the glory, Jesus. Would you move among us? Give us faith to say yes to you. We pray these things in your name. Anderson, if you agree, would you say amen? You can be seated. Let's give, let's give, uh, let's give, let's give, it's on. Let's give Hank Murphy and the band a big round of applause. It's on. Uh, didn't know that little bitty guy could rap. Little bitty man did a good job. That makes me want to come back out to the concert tonight, man. Good job. Thank you guys for being here. Yeah, 7 o'clock tonight, concert with Hank and the band. Make sure you come out and be a part of that. 
Uh, my name's Clayton King. Great to be back at Anderson. My 23rd year preaching here in the metropolis. I love Anderson University. How many of you are freshmen? If you're a freshman or a fresh woman, would you raise your hand? Welcome to Anderson University, the best four, five, six, seven, or eight years of your life. <laughs> also want to uh, say hello to all of our people in Merritt Theater, as well as next door in Daniel Recital Hall. That's one of the great honors of being a part of Anderson. This is a growing community, and uh, we have to have overflow for chapel and for campus worship, so I'm really proud uh, to be able to come and preach for you today. I am originally from Fountain Inn, South Carolina. And uh, I uh, <clears throat> graduated from Hillcrest High School, and I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. We were state champs last year in football, first time ever in our history. God is a God of miracles. <laughs> That's why I believe the Dallas Cowboys will win the Super Bowl this year. I believe in miracles. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple of people that are really important to me and special to me, uh, just so you kind of know the relationship that we have with Anderson University. I'm part of a ministry called Crossroads and Clayton King Ministries, and we've been doing this for 20 years. And we moved a year ago our entire ministry operation to this campus. And so uh, right across the street from the new student center that's being built are our offices. And we've been here for about a year, and I've got my staff and our interns are with me today. Uh, we have an entire team that does uh, lots of different ministry. Uh, we did our first year of summer camps here this past summer. We had about 4,600 teenagers. We had 1,100 students respond to the gospel and make a decision for Christ this summer. And we praise God for that. <clears throat> We have uh, a missions agency and a student conference and a, a group of guys and girls that go out and travel and speak. Uh, two of them will be speaking in chapel in the next few weeks. Zach Dixon, one of our speakers, will be here in a few weeks, as well as my lovely wife who will be speaking in chapel. And Shari, would you just kind of raise your hand and wave so everybody can know? This is my wife. I love her. 16 years, 5 months, and 16 days today that we've been married. And I love you more today than the day I first laid my eyes on you. Thank you for being my wife and my best friend and my partner in ministry. And I'm going to stop now because it's getting embarrassing. Um, <laughs> have my two children with me. Joseph is sitting right beside my wife. J Jojo, would you raise your hand? And Jacob, my 13-year-old who just turned 13. Jacob, wave. We've also got uh, our staff, staff and interns. Would you guys wave? Uh, they're up here on the first couple of rows. And uh, they work, like I said, right around the corner. We love being a part of what God's doing here in this campus, partnering with you uh, in all sorts of different avenues. One way that you might want to get involved with us, uh, there are two trips to Guatemala happening. Uh, there's a trip that Campus Ministries is putting together in December uh, over Christmas break. And I know some of you are interested in going on that trip. That'll be a great trip, partnering with Campus Ministries. And I know that you can get information through them. And then we've got a trip through our ministry going to Guatemala in November over Thanksgiving break. And so we love being able to partner with Anderson University in so many ways. This is our home and we love it. And we love being here and we love the jockey lot and we love Skins Hot Dogs and we love radio and we love traffic on 81 and we love the fact that the brand new Starbucks is open right beside Chick-fil-A just around the corner from campus. Well, I want to be mindful of your, of your time today. I know that you're dying to get back to class. So if you'll allow me to, I'd like to dive directly into the message today. Um, I, was, I did a, a live periscope before I came into to, uh, campus worship this morning, talking about the value of long-term relationships in ministry. And for me, I've literally preached hundreds of messages on this campus in the last 23 years, uh, most of them in this very room. But I don't know if I've ever preached one that feels as raw and emotional as this one. And this is a message that I preached all summer at our camps. Uh, it's a message that I want to share with you from the depths of my heart in hopes that you will find encouragement and strength from it. It's not a, uh, necessarily a funny message. It's an encouraging and hopeful message. But I want to, if you'll allow me to, for the next 20 minutes or so, I want to just um, open up my soul to you and peel back the outer layer of who I appear to be and show you kind of what I've gone through in my own life at age, now at age 42, and some of the surprises that I was not expecting in my walk with Jesus. 
Uh, usually, uh, for a, a new audience, many of you freshmen that have never met me before, I would spend a little more time cutting up and joking around, but I don't really have enough time to do that today. So if you'll let me, I just want to kind of dive straight into this message. At the end of campus worship today, uh, when you walk out into the lobby, you're going to be able to uh, get a free gift, Compliments of Anderson University. It's a book that I spent about a year writing. It's a book called Stronger. And I want to tell you why I wrote the book and where this book came from. It was a book I had to write. Because honestly, if I didn't write the book, I felt like what was inside of me would, would kill me and devastate me. When I became a Christian at age 14, I... I had an assumption, nobody really told me this, but I just assumed that giving my life to Jesus meant that my life was going to be easy and that it was all going to be fun and that all the test scores would be A plus and all the red lights would be green when I drove through them and every door would open up and prosperity and blessing and increase and favor and nothing but good would happen to me in my life. And for a season, that was kind of the way it went. I'm adopted. My mom gave me up for adoption when I was born. She was 14 when she got pregnant with me, 15 when she delivered me. Praise God she was pro-life. Um, praise God that she gave me a chance to live. And I was adopted by a great family. They were not perfect. We were not rich, not even close, but my mom and dad loved me, and they loved the Lord, and they were just great parents. Not perfect, flawed and sinful and broken, just like the rest of us. <clears throat> but I had a great life. I worked hard, lived in a small farming community, um, had a real good experience, gave my life to Jesus, and for a few years as God began to open the doors, things were going great. And then um, I started to experience true, real, tangible suffering. So since I've only got 20 minutes, I'm going to fast forward through a lot of the detail. I hope you'll read about it in the book uh, because you're going to have a chance to go through that book together in your dorms. And you're going to have a chance to work through this and hopefully form your own theology of what it means to follow Christ, even in the midst of hard times and suffering. But let me share with you what happened in my life. But before I do that, I want to show you where I found comfort in the 12-year period of my life that at times I didn't know if I would survive. Because when my life started to fall apart... And when my family members started dying one after another after another, it really caused me to question what I believed and what I believed about God. And if I really believed that God was good and if I really believed that God's word was true and if I really believed that I could trust God and ultimately if I really believed whether or not God loved me because that's always the question. That's always the question. We, we can many times get tied up in the superficialities of life, but the ultimate question is really whether or not we believe we are unconditionally loved by God. Because that is where we base our identity and our activity flows from our identity. So when our identity is based in the unconditional love of our Father God, our activities will reflect that. And so I found comfort in these words from the Apostle Paul in two passages of Scripture that run side by side in 2 Corinthians. Paul wrote this letter to a church that he loved dearly in the ancient Greek city of Corinth. This church was struggling. These believers were having a hard time. And Paul, instead of boasting in his accomplishments, instead of bragging in his accolades, Paul took a different approach to encourage these struggling Christians. Instead of trying to show them how awesome he was, he instead showed them how broken he was. And instead of trying to put a, a facade of success, he opened up his soul and showed them how hard his life had been and how much he had suffered because of the gospel. Let me just read without commentary the list that Paul gives them and that by grace we get today. From 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23b, Paul says these words, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. 
By the way, if he had only suffered this one particular thing, it would have been enough to not only end his life, but to emotionally and physically scar him forever. The 40 lashes minus one was a form of beating and torture that the Jews used to punish criminals. They took a device called a cat of nine tails, which was a, a long handle, a wooden handle, with nine leather tassels about a foot and a half to three feet long on the end. These nine leather tassels were soaked in water to make them hurt more, and embedded in all of those tassels were pieces of rock and bone and metal and glass. And they would take a criminal and they would tie that criminal by the hands. And they would either stretch his arms above his head to tighten up the skin along his back and torso, or they would make him lay over a boulder or a rock of some sort to stretch the skin tied across his back and his stomach. And a Jewish soldier, and the Romans would also use this form of torture, would then take that cat of nine tails and they would beat that person. And they were allowed by Jewish law to hit them 39 times with a cat of nine tails. Not 40, only 39. That's why it was called the 40 lashes minus one. Because at 40 lashes, the thought was, you have now entered into a place where this person would die. Paul was whipped like that not once, not twice, not three, not four times, five times. Do the math. 195 lashes across his back and torso. So when Paul says in Galatians 6, 17, at the end of his letter, as an old man, decrepit, beat down, body broken, probably two or three inches of thick scar tissue on his back, just from the 40 lashes minus one, five times. When Paul says in Galatians 6, 17, let nobody cause me trouble because I bear on my body the marks of Christ. He literally had physical scars. But those scars told his story. And that's what our scars do. When you're wounded, when you're hurt, when your mom dies of cancer, when your parents get divorced, when you get married and you have a miscarriage, when you get married and all of your friends are getting pregnant and you can't, when the money runs out, when the pink slip is given to you at 4.30 on a Friday, when the relationship you were banking on is now over, when you get the call that your dad is in the hospital about to die and you need to come and be with him, those times may not have come to you yet, but they will. If you live long enough, you're going to hurt. If you live long enough, you're going to know real pain. If you live long enough, you're going to suffer. The question is, will you suffer alone in your flesh or will you give that suffering to Jesus Christ? Because none of us gets an exemption from suffering, but Christians get something better, a companion. None of us gets an exemption. We can all have a companion even as we bear the scars that tell our story. Paul goes on to say, three times, verse 25, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rulers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of all my concern for the churches. And then he cries out who is weak and I do not feel weak do you see here the greatest apostle the greatest evangelist the greatest church planter that ever lived is revealing his weakness he's not hiding it he's showcasing it but not for his own glory he's showcasing his weakness for the glory of God because he knows intuitively something that I know and I believe something that you know we all relate to human beings who hurt because we hurt and we know what it feels like and the other thing that we all know intuitively is that none of us can turn away from a good story I can get up here and preach theology and I try to do that and every time I preach there's theology involved I could get up here and lecture you and and, and use big words that you don't understand and most of you would check out 
But when somebody stands up on the stage and they begin to tell a compelling story and you're interested in it and there are characters and there's drama and there's some kind of twist and there's some sort of adversity they have to overcome. I've seen it for 28 years in ministry. When someone tells a compelling story, the audience leans in to listen. And that is what Paul is doing here. He's telling a story. Here are the things I've suffered because of Jesus. But by the grace of God, I made it. And you will too. And then he says this in verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Then in the very very next chapter, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, he continues with this idea, and this is where I found encouragement, this is where I found strength when I went through a 12-year period of my life that I really questioned and was so confused about what God was doing and if God really loved me. I went again and again to this passage of Scripture. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with God to take it away, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. This makes no sense to our world because in American culture, strength means dominance. Strength means a Super Bowl victory. Strength means an undefeated team. Strength means a a robust economy and a strong military. Strength means that you never show weakness, even if you feel it, you hide it. But in the kingdom of God, strength flows out of weakness because weakness isn't wasted when it's a way for God to work in our life. Weakness isn't wasted when it's a way for God to work in our life. I'm going to say it one more time. Weakness isn't wasted when it's a way for God to work in our life. And Paul understood that. Because when he was at the end of himself, Jesus got the spotlight. And sometimes we don't realize that Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. And that's what I learned. Long story short, I lost nine family members over the course of 12 years. When I say lost them, I mean they died. My grandmother died. Um, My grandfather died right after that. My great uncle dropped dead of a heart attack in my backyard. He'd just been fishing in my dad's pond. I preached every one of their funerals. Fast forward to November of of 2010. On a Thursday afternoon, I went home to see my parents in Fountain Inn. As I was leaving, I asked my mom how she was feeling. My dad was terminally ill with diabetes and heart disease and all sorts of other physical ailments. My brother was ruining his life in a a terrible, terrible drug addiction. Um, My mom walked out to me, uh, walked out to the car with me and I said, mom, how are you feeling? You don't look good. She said, son, I'm, I'm not doing well. I'm a lot worse than you know. My mom was hiding several things from us. She was hiding a a kidney disease. She was also hiding a prescription pain addiction because of the pain that my mom was feeling and because of all that she was going through. uh, She was Uh, taking prescription pills, getting prescriptions from four or five different doctors just to manage her pain. Meantime, it was shutting down her kidneys slowly. And at two o'clock on Thursday afternoon, my mom looked at me in the face and said, I'm going to die one day real soon. And you guys are going to find me dead in the kitchen floor. And you'll know it was stress and worry that did it. That was Thursday at two o'clock. Sunday, three days later, four days technically. I called my mom, talked to her on the phone from the airport in Charlotte on my way to Toronto. Talked to her for 10 minutes, hung off the phone, landed in Toronto. When I landed in Toronto, I got word that they had found my mom dead in the kitchen floor, just like she said she was going to die. Spent the loneliest night of my life in an airport hotel by myself in Toronto, Canada. My mom was dead. I had to call my wife and my boys to tell them couldn't get home till the next day. Started wondering, what am I going to do with my dad? My mom was taking care of my dad. He was on dialysis every other day. My mom died. I, my, my dates may be off by a day or two, but if my memory serves me correctly, she died. She died on a Sunday. Three days later, I preached her funeral. Three days later was Thanksgiving. Two days later was my birthday. Three days after that was her birthday. Three days after that was my brother's birthday. Three weeks later was Christmas. I 
I had to come face to face with some hard questions. Is the gospel really true? For years I've been singing, Christ is enough for me. Now is he? No big stage, no gigantic youth conference I'm speaking at. I'm not giving an invitation and seeing a lot of people come forward. No, I'm laying in my bed at night, waking up with a panic attack at 2 a.m., dreaming that my dad is dying, dreaming that my mom is reaching for me. And I began to know real, true weakness. 18 months later, after I had finally had to put my dad into a nursing home, cared for my dad, shaved my dad, bathed my dad, brushed my dad's hair, fed my dad, cleaned my dad up when he could not control his bodily functions. Got a phone call while my family was at the beach. We hadn't had a vacation in a year and a half, and we finally got away to the beach just to try to relax a little bit. We'd been there a couple of days, and I got the phone call that my dad had another heart attack on dialysis. The doctor put my dad on the phone, and my dad said, Son, I'm ready to die. I'm tired of fighting. I'm old. I'm sick. I want to be with Jesus. I want to see your mom. Can you come and stay with me until I die? And I spent the last two and a half days and nights with my dad in the hospital until we moved him into a hospice facility. And I don't have time to tell you my greatest regret. You can read about it in the book. But my dad died, and I preached my dad's funeral on Father's Day. Nine family members in 12 years. And then not long after that, I was getting ready to board a a flight to go preach in uh, Ohio. And I had my laptop out trying to finish the book deadline for Stronger, the book I wanted to write about what I'd learned of how God's strength is made perfect through the gospel and our weakness. And I got a phone call. The last one of my family in that 12-year period. Let me read to you what I wrote in my journal that day. I want to read to you. I I didn't write a letter to a church in Corinth, but I wrote some stuff in my journal that day that I've learned losing all these people and going through all of this depression and all of this anxiety and all of this fear over a 12-year period. I had my laptop out and I was pounding on the keys, working on the chapter dealing with vulnerability for this very book when our plane began to board. I shut down and packed up and then I got a phone call from my uncle telling me that his wife, my Aunt Gwen, had died a few hours earlier. I was sucker punched in the heart. Not again. Dear God, not again. Gwen was like a mom to me. She and my dad were best friends, and they were the closest of siblings. Now, she was dead too less than two years after I buried my own dad. And, of course, I would preach her funeral in three days. So I boarded the plane and began to write again. This time I wasn't writing on my laptop. I was writing in my journal. My ears were ringing. My heart was pounding. My stomach was churning. But I managed to scribble a few things on those pages while the wound was still fresh and pouring blood. For the next three days in Ohio, these words sustained me. And I believe they came from the Spirit of God to my weak and wounded soul. Here is what I wrote verbatim by hand in my journal that day. Hard times don't make me happy, but by God's grace, they keep me humble and make me holy. Where there's no death, there can be no resurrection. Where there's no cross, there can be no empty tomb. Peace isn't the absence of crisis in my life. It's the presence of Christ in my crisis. Just because I feel invisible, it doesn't mean I'm not valuable. God works in my weakness because that's all he has to work with. Before every triumph, there's a trial. Before every testimony, there's a test. My greatest mess becomes my signature message. I can't stop when I feel stuck. I have to keep moving forward in faith. I want to give up, but if I'm not dead, God's not done. If I'm still breathing, I can keep going. I don't have to feed every feeling. Just because I'm lonely doesn't mean that God left me. I need to stop seeking happiness and start seeking holiness because pain has a way of purifying my motives and clarifying my calling. 
God is not punishing me for failure. He's pruning me for fruitfulness. And I'll just read you one more. The things that break me are the things that bring me close to God. When I decided to tell this story, when I decided to write this book, when I decided that this would be my signature message from the scriptures, I told God in my study one morning, I'll write this book and I'll kick the hornet's nest and I'll dredge up all the pain and all the grief and all the emotion and I'll do all of that, Jesus, but I am trusting you to take this story and save people through it. And I can tell you by the grace of God that when we open up our hearts and share our weakness, when we let ourselves be vulnerable to God and we admit our sin and our brokenness, the Spirit of God comes to us. Jesus is drawn to broken, humble people who will simply say, this is who I am. It's all I got. I'm all yours, Jesus. And as I have preached this message, I have seen God use it. And yesterday morning, 24 hours ago, less than an hour from here, 66 college students responded to the gospel, trusting Christ for the first time, not as a result of anything I did, but as a result of God's strength being made perfect in weakness. So I will not be quiet or silent about my suffering. I will use it as a point in my life to say Jesus is stronger. Jesus is better. Jesus is enough. And if you don't have Jesus, you need him. And if you don't realize right now how much you need Jesus, you will. I would suggest that you recognize it now because he loves you and he will not give you a companion from hard times. Excuse me, he will not give you an exemption from hard times, but he will be your companion through them because he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord, I wanna ask you that you would take this word today that Paul shared 2,000 years ago and that we are now able to share in this house. And I pray that you would draw weak, broken sinners to the beauty of the gospel. I'm gonna ask you to keep your eyes closed, please, and your hearts open. In every one of our locations today, here, Merritt, Daniel, I want to invite you. I'm not gonna ask anyone to stand up and I'm not gonna ask anyone to come forward, but I want to invite you if you have never admitted your brokenness and confessed your sin, if you've never repented of your sin and trusted Jesus, I am trusting the Spirit of God and the Word of God to draw your heart to the gospel today. I don't have it figured out and I'm weaker than I've ever been. But I'm telling you that Jesus has not only sustained me, but Jesus has given me faith and hope and victory through the dark night of the soul that I have survived. And by his grace alone, you can know him, you can be his child, you can have him as a companion and the Lord of your life. So if you wanna give your life to Jesus today, if you are willing to admit your brokenness and own your weakness, if you are willing to call on the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13 says he'll save you. And if you'll confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9 says he'll forgive you. So that's the invitation I wanna extend to you today. Stop trying to be in control. Own up to your weakness, admit your sin, repent and trust Christ and you can begin a relationship with God today. So if you wanna do that, if you wanna give your life to Jesus, if you wanna know Christ, if you wanna belong to him, if you want to be born again and born new, pray this to Jesus right where you sit. It's not a magic prayer. The words don't save you, and I'm not praying the prayer for you. You can respond to the gospel by God's grace right now. Pray this to him in your heart quietly right where you sit. If the Spirit of God has drawn you to the gospel today, Jesus, I need you. Just go ahead, pray it to him right now. He's listening. Jesus, I need you. I give you my life. I give you my sin. I give you my regrets, my past, my shame, my confusion, my doubts, my hurt. Please forgive me, Jesus. I want to follow you. 
I believe in you. I put my trust in you. And I'm yours now. I love you, Jesus. I know I'm weak, but you are stronger. Thank you for saving me. Now with your eyes closed and your hearts open, here and in Daniel and in Merit, I wanna ask one simple question. I'm not gonna make you stand up or come forward, but if you just prayed that prayer, to Jesus and you meant it. I want you to do something quickly and deliberately. Will you, if you just prayed to receive Christ, will you raise your hand straight up above your head? Just raise your hand up right now if you just prayed that prayer to Jesus. Not to me, to Jesus. Raise it up high. Come on. I want to see them. Straighten your elbow all the way out, please. Get them up high. Get them up high. Daniel, do it too. Sullivan, do it too. I mean, Merritt. Keep them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. Keep them up. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 27 here in the auditorium. I don't know how many in the other rooms. You can put your hands down right now. Before the band leads us in one final song, can everybody open their eyes and look at me in every location? The Bible says when one sinner repents of their sin, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. 27 people just repented right here and more in the other rooms. Can we rejoice with the angels and with God? Here's what I want to ask you to do before, before the band leads us in one final song. Can we get that up on the screens, guys? If you just responded to the gospel, whether it was your first time or or whatever God was doing in your heart, here's what we wanna do. We wanna follow up with you. Jesus doesn't just want decisions. He wants decisions that lead to disciples. So would you please text your residence hall, this number right here, and just give them your name. If you just prayed to receive Christ, you can take out your phone during this next song. As a matter of fact, I know all of you got your phones. Go ahead and everybody take out your phone right now. Just go ahead. That way it doesn't feel awkward for the people that just responded to the gospel. Take out your phone. And if you just gave your life to Jesus, would you just text your name to this number right here, okay? Just text your name to this number and someone from Campus Ministries, from Greg's office, uh, will be able to help follow up with you because we wanna help you. This is a great community, guys. Anderson University is a great place for you to grow spiritually. So we're thankful that you responded to the gospel and that you prayed to receive Christ, but that isn't the end, that is just the beginning, amen? Jesus wants discipleship. He wants us to follow him and live together and do life together. So text your name to this number and, uh, and you'll be getting some response about what the next step is for you. The band's gonna lead us in one final song. As you leave today out in the lobby, grab a copy of your book. If you're in Merritt Theater, your books will be out in the lobby at Merritt. And if you're next door in Daniel, you'll come over here to this lobby and you can get a copy of Stronger. That's a gift to you from Anderson, something that you're going to work through together as a student body this semester to hopefully help you how, understand how God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. Jesus, thank you for what you've done today at Campus Worship. We bless your name. To God be the glory. You are good, God. You are wonderful in spite of what we feel. In a moment, we know that you are good, sovereign, and powerful forever. Thank you that you love us. And thank you that you're strong. In Jesus' name, amen. away the sins of the world. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betray, the sin of men and wrath of God has been
this is how we know what love is. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor. great morning for campus worship. It's been great in Henderson. I know it's been great in Daniel. Yeah, that's good. Folks who got saved today. Yeah. People crossed over from darkness to light, from death to life today at Anderson University. It's a time to be excited. Listen, 
If you made a decision this morning, if you raised your hand up, you prayed that prayer, please, please, if you're in here, I'm going to be standing down front in Merritt. Dr. Klein is, uh, is there in Merritt Theater in Daniel. Uh, Josh Crocker and Becky Walker are there. We want to talk to you. There are connectors at all of the locations. Talk to them. Talk to your RAs. Uh, talk to your friends. Don't keep this to yourself. Tell people. Tell us. Uh, we want to minister to you and share this celebration with you and disciple you. It doesn't end here. It begins here and goes forward. Uh, so we're just very excited. I'm going to ask that they put the, the slide back up on the, on the screen. If you didn't get a chance to earlier, text your name, your residence hall, text it to that, to that number so that we can follow up with you and, uh, and be praying for you. And uh, just real quickly, don't forget the concert tonight. Make it a point to be here. It is free. You can receive journey credit. But above all of that, it's going to be a great time of worship and celebration. And so just wanted to make sure about that. If you're interested in a mission trip, that uh, meeting is going to be tonight in Chapman Multimedia Room at 8.30 as well. All right, thank you so much for your attention today. Thank you, God, for what you have done in this place.